It featured atrocities committed by both sides. The guerrilla fighting after 1861 produced a form of terrorism that exceeded anything else in the war. Jayhawking Kansans and Missouri bushwhackers famously took no prisoners, killed in cold blood, plundered and burned. Three years before scorched earth warfare became a concept forever associated with the Susquehanna, I'm sorry, the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia under General Philip Sheridan, it was already common here. But the guerrilla chieftains of Missouri initiated a new breed of slaughter of unarmed soldiers and civilians the day he came to Lawrence. They helped make the war here on the Kansas-Missouri border a war between peoples, not just between armies. A true bellum omnium contra omnes, or war of all against all in Thomas Hobbes' memorial, memorable phrase. This too should be remembered. Furious for revenge to even the score of the burning of Osceola, to make Yankees pay for the collapse of a building in Kansas City that lodged some incarcerated female relatives of the guerrillas, several companies of raiders combined under Quantrill's leadership, 450 men bent on murder and destruction. The townspeople of Lawrence went to sleep the night of August 20th, feeling relatively safe and secure. What shatter and intelligence had been gathered about a raid was pretty much ignored by the Union Army, and even our town's leaders. And this feeling of peace and security was only enhanced <clears throat> as citizens gathered to hear a concert by our own Lawrence City Band, forebears of the people we will hear play here tonight on this very different August night, who were showing off new instruments paid for by the citizens of our prosperous town. This serenity and sense of security were shattered in the early morning of August 21st, 1863, when Quantrill addressed his assembled army just ahead of me, where 11th Street crosses Rhode Island. Boys, this is the home of Jim Lane and Jennison. Give no quarter, kill every male, burn every house, he was heard to say. For the next four hours, visitors from Missouri massacred approximately 200 men and boys and burned to the ground a quarter of the town's buildings. I say approximately because many victims were never found. We've done our best to list every name we could in the program you have in your hands tonight. Richard Cordley, a name every Laurentian should remember, was the pastor of the Plymouth Congregational Church and was among the most eloquent chroniclers of what happened that terrible day. <coughs> Massachusetts Street, he wrote, was one bed of embers. The dead lay along the sidewalk, many of them so burned they could not be recognized and could scarcely be taken up. Here and there among the embers could be seen the bones of those who had perished in the buildings that had been consumed. Sadly, we read versions of these words all too often with datelines like Cairo or New York City or Decreet. Cordley also wrote of an incident that is still haunting, at least personally to me, a century and a half later. Our attention, he recalled, was soon attracted by loud wailings. We went to the direction of the sound and among the ashes of a large building sat a woman holding in her hands the blackened skull of her husband who was shot and burned in that place. Her cries could be heard over the whole desolated town and added much to the feeling of sadness and horror which filled every heart. This for me as a proud resident of this town is one of the transcendent lessons of the 1863 massacre. For those of us who hate war and wanton destruction and retributive violence, this woman whose name has been lost to history connects us with a long ago past. As I said, it is fitting and it is good to commemorate such an awful human tragedy an act of violence and mass murder that shocked and roused an entire nation. But it is better still to commemorate what happened next. For as the mayor told us, Lawrence's worst day was immediately followed by some of its best. Because the women, and it was mostly the women, and men who survived this massacre came together, determined to rebuild, not just to survive, but to thrive. Lawrence, Kansas would not be Osceola. Here are some descriptions of what happened in Lawrence after the raiders scurried back to Missouri. According to Cordley, the work of gathering and burying the dead began immediately until, quote, the floor of the Methodist church, which was taken as a sort of hospital, was covered with dead and wounded. Volunteers scoured the embers for nails to be used for coffins. Wagon loads of food, of medicine, of clothing, first from Leavenworth and then even from the uh, cities of western Missouri, arrived to feed, clothe, and heal the sick and the hungry. Credit arrived from banks as far away as St. Louis and Boston. Single family homes were transformed into rooming houses and John Spear, the owner of the, and editor of the Tribune, who himself lost a son and his printer, 
in the raid began work immediately reporting on the disaster and published a special issue six days later in Topeka that is still very important to historians like myself. We'll be hearing from John Spear later tonight. Construction began almost immediately on the quirky, genuine Holland windmill that would soon dot Lawrence's skyline, just south of Ninth and Emory. Within the year, the mill was harnessing the abundant Kansas wind to grind wheat and corn. City leaders asked Shaler Eldridge to rebuild his hotel, universally known as the finest in town, and he agreed. And work recommenced raising money, hiring faculty, and breaking ground for the new college, and later flagship state university, to be built atop the same ridge William Quantrill used to survey the burning town, proud of the destruction he had wrought during the raid. I understand a saloon keeper in Kansas City is planning to celebrate Quantrill's raid on Wednesday night in what can only be termed an insensitive and misguided attempt to peddle gin, raise spirits about a losing football team, and rekindle at least some of the emotions and attitude which led to the horrific violence of 1863. Our commemoration here tonight seeks a more laudable goal, to recall the names of the real people cut down before their time, and to emphasize how, even in the wake of tragedy, neighbors can band together, overcome, join hands, and rebuild a city even stronger and greater than it was before. Our forebears did this 150 years ago, and tonight we remember. And now it's my honor to present Quantrill's Raid survivor, John Spear, and his wife Elizabeth with the honor roll of victims' names. Today is August 21st in the year of our Lord, 1864. 1864, one year, one year after the black cloak of death spread upon us. My name is John Spear, a simple newspaperman, and this is my wife Elizabeth. We came to this town from Ohio. I arrived early, September 29th, 1854 just 10 years ago. Some of you have read my newspaper, the Kansas Weekly Tribune, or, or later the, the Lawrence Republican. Excuse me. Here in this city of Lawrence came the locusts from Missouri. Lawrence, the freedom city, where true men of God hastened from the east to give this nation, this union, a beacon, a guide to America towards glory and righteousness. Early on, some called it New Boston, some called it Yankee Town, but finally, to honor Amos T. Lawrence of the Massachusetts Immigrant Aid Society, Lawrence was chosen. The locusts from Missouri came to devour our grain. The good and honorable men who lived and made this city great in the eyes of all who desired to erase the blot, the stain of slavery from our shores. The locusts came. Quantrill and his band of, of drunken sots descended on our sleeping town. They robbed, they burned, they murdered. But this was not war. Rather, this was an attack on a sleeping and defenseless town. The locusts from Missouri came to feed on the grain of our city. They came to maim, to kill, to loot, burn the grain in our barn. Many are gone. Many are left. This then 
for those that are left is our obligation. We will make this city of Lawrence live on to a bright and lasting tribute for the souls who perished here by the locusts from Missouri. Damn that man Quantrill and his disciples of hell. Remember the dead.